welcome everyone and good morning. So I am what they call a futurologist and this is both an art as well as a science. I have to constantly study and analyze market forces, economic structures, consumer behavior, sociology, political turbulence of which there is a lot at the moment and of course to find and test the biggest breakthroughs coming from digital and technology and then envision the ways in which we're going to be able to apply these and prepare the scenarios that could get us where we want to be. Now, through my forecasting lab, I focus only on the most human centered advances because I believe we need to progress both profit and purpose, take humanity and people at the same pace as our technological development. Otherwise, you see, we may go really fast, but we won't actually achieve what we need to. Now, I don't need my forecasting skills to tell me that you are listening today because you're very intrigued by the subject matter. But I'm guessing you're also possibly suffering from a little bit of webinar fatigue. So I'm not going to make this talk full of slides or show you tons of charts and predictive models, even though that is the world I often live in. I'm instead going to apply a piece of research from neuroscience, which tells us that our brains actually respond best to information through active dialogue and moving multimedia. So I'm actually going to play five very intriguing videos throughout this talk, two of which actually show us an experiment in human behavior. So I actually want to start by asking you all a question. And I'm sorry we can't be there in person, but this is the next best thing. So I want to know how many meetings do you think, do each of you think it takes on average within your teams in order to reach a significant decision in your business? Is it six? Is it eight? Is it 12? Is it 16? Think of a figure. Now, let me tell you what the answer is. So. A very large McKinsey study found that major decisions within an organization used to be reached on average, I kid you not, in between 22 and 26 meetings in 2019. That really surprised me as well. But this year, that figure is now seven to nine. That's quite a big shift. So what I'm trying to illustrate with this is that when a crisis actually hits, some of the aspects of an organization that were actually set in stone can start to get unlocked and moving because we can use the pressure from this kind of situation to do this. It's helped us remove some unhelpful bureaucracies to upend and reboot tedious processes and change some of the things that were actually holding us back. We're seeing that we can work with some amount of a distributed workforce, that we can actually have some of the people in our organizations that perhaps weren't necessarily in senior leadership positions, but allow them to step up as well and take on much more of a decision making role. I'm seeing that unfold myself in all the advisory work that I do. You know, I'm called in by governments such as the mayor of London, companies such as Microsoft and Norton, and also startups as well to come in and help them see what we could tweak to make sure their transformation works better. Now I want to actually play our first video of the session and I really want you to watch this carefully for some cues. This clip shows a duality. One is the value of everything being interconnected, right? We're at the Internet of Things, sure, but actually we're at the Internet of Everything, IOE, right from the smart home to the smart car to actually the smart body. You know, we've got something called a digital pill that's been developed in the US, approved by the FDA last year, which is full of sensors, safe to swallow, made of digestible materials, the size of a regular pill where you swallow it and it will swim into your bloodstream safely and send some of the most deep and accurate markers of your biology from inside your body and send that to your clinician and yourself 
to also detect precancerous cells before they become a serious problem, to predict when someone has seizures, when they're going to have a big epileptic fit, to be able to tell us that we're going to get ill before we even know we are. So this is the mind blowing power of some of these amazing advancements from the fourth industrial revolution. But that's why I call it an internet of bodies. So I'm going to play the video now. I'm going to request the Hager team to play video one, please. This is the cat that drank the milk and let in the dog that jumped on the woman who brewed the coffee. Brew coffee. That woke the man who was late for work. All right, I gotta go. And drove the car. Driverless mode engaged. That found the parking spot. Find space. Parking space found. That alerted the door that opened the control room. Hey, Bob. That secured the data that directed the turbines, that powered the sprinklers, that watered the grass, that fed the cow, that made the milk, that went to the store, that reminded the man to buy the milk. It was poured by the girl who loved the cat, that drank the milk. The internet of everything is changing everything. So I wonder if you caught the dazed expression on the man's face and in his body language. And for me, the cue from this is all this interconnectivity is going to certainly make our lives very efficient. OK, but we don't also want our everyday lives and our work to be so fueled by countless lines of code that it starts to become too clinical and actually create automated humans. Let's leave that to the software. But the really good news is that I'm finally seeing digital engineering, as I call it, put people's needs at its core rather than retrofitting professionals into the equation as an afterthought. That is indeed one of the positives to come out of the current pandemic. And very quickly, there are two other striking opportunities as well that we can take from 2020. The first is what we can call a moral economy. What are our unspoken obligations beyond the ecosystem of our companies? What are the values driving my organization? How can I keep my workforce safe mentally and physically? And actually, there's a did you know style question I have for you here. And it's a study from Stanford University that I read just last week. And you may think that this has nothing to do with this talk or the world of business, but it does. So bear with me. So are you aware that it takes only 500 milliseconds, that's half a second, for your entire body to experience the hardwired chemical reaction that's associated with a fight or flight stress response? I think that's quite surprising to hear half a second for the entire body, all your neurons to be charged up from top to toe and experience that chemical reaction right from cortisol to high stress. And these Stanford researchers observed that this human stress response is the same because you're just as alarmed whether you're reacting to a predator, such as a wild animal in the woods, not many of us encounter that, or an intense or negative work email or text. And the effects from that one moment can actually stay in your body, not just minutes, but hours or even days. And this impairs our cognitive abilities, our decision making, our functional kind of state of mind. Now, I'm not mentioning this because I'm a well-being expert. I'm not an expert on that. I don't talk about mental health. However, where we are right now during this unique time in the world, it is more vital than ever for all of us to think about employee well-being, not as an afterthought or something soft or something for the HR team to roll up or something that women think about, but actually a far more serious factor that will impact the company's business outcomes. And at the end of this talk, in fact, I'll share a little tip that came up in that article from the world's top doctors about how we can counter this work anxiety. My other observation is to do with digital transformation. This is a word that's probably overused, isn't it? Transformation. But finally, I'm seeing that from the pressure of the pandemic, companies large and small 
are now finally looking at transformation as not just an upgrade of existing infrastructure or platform migration, because that's not going to position them where they need. I've been saying this for years. Instead, they are now investing more of their transformation program budget into the more progressive next generation tools that will help keep businesses future ready. You see, digital transformation needs to include much more than just a slightly upgraded new cloud infrastructure, but actually new data science platforms, looking at things like nanotech and building materials, looking at emotive AI, which I'll talk about, different ways to protect our digital identity. We've got to stay a bit close to this experimentation and risk if we're going to actually drive new business lines and revenue. And finally, the bigger businesses are actually trying to see the market signals earlier and react faster in the more nimble way that I believe many of you are from SMBs in the more nimble way that SMBs do. And this is starting to unlock and happen. So I'm a futurist that focuses on finding the advances that will elevate our potential. So let me now take you through two of those areas that need to be on your radar. The first I'm going to kick off with is what I call human perception artificial intelligence. Now, the technical name for this is effective computing. That's effective with an A. Think of this as emotionally aware software that can perceive, understand, but also respond to the way that we as humans talk, feel and think. This is software with human cognition. Now, I presented some of my findings from my five years of study into this last year at the Oslo Business Forum, where the former uh, Prime Minister of the UK, David Cameron, was someone I was interviewing after that as well. And he heard it and he said, human cognition in software, this sounds a bit far-fetched. But after my talk, he came up to me and he said, I get it. This actually sounds fascinating. We do need this in our businesses. So I hope you'll feel the same. Now, anything powered by a conversational interface between a human and a piece of software is impacted by this. Whether this is a smart home device, whether this is connected factories, you know, you've got factory floors that actually do have an IoT component, whether it's a customer service bot on an e-commerce website, even productivity software. As long as the premise of the system is that it has a back and forth with you and it needs to base its response on what you tell it, if this, then that, that kind of notion, then using human perception AI, it can start to finally base its response on the fuller situational context rather than the narrower set of data. So I'm going to show you a powerful video now with examples. And I actually want to play one that makes the case first, however, for why there is a disconnect when machines just don't understand humans. Now, this one has a bit of light humor in it because that's actually a great way to drive home a point sometimes. So we're going to play that one first and it kind of lays the case for why we do need this bridge between man and machine. Please, can we play video two? Playing jazz. Playing jazz. Smoothie. Making smoothie. Calendar. No meetings today. Remember, dentist at 9.30. Fire off. Fire off. Open door. Door open. And we're going to do one more. Oh, yeah. Open door. Wrong voice command. Open door. Wrong voice command. Open. Open door. Repeat that. Open door. I didn't understand that. Hey, open door! Play on the floor. Sink on the floor. Open the door. So it's a bit amusing, but I wanted to make sure I woke us up a little bit this morning as well with that. OK, so that gives you a sense of conversational interfaces that still don't work. To be honest, I've given up on using Siri and even sometimes Alexa. It doesn't always understand my Indo-British accent. 
And half the time, to be honest, I come away from that interaction thinking I didn't get what I needed. It would have been faster for me to look it up. Also, when we think of conversational interfaces, most importantly, with the commercial impact of customer service, engaging with your stakeholders, whether it's B2B or B2B or B2C. Now, I want to show us a video that has three use cases of where it can actually better our work outcomes. The first is showing us how we can take our level of customer service bots from level one or two to level three or four, where this can just act as a first point of interaction to give someone the information they need, in most cases, outside the confines of customer service hours, which are usually, let's say, nine to five. So if at 8 p.m. I need to get in touch with my bank and ask them something really important, given I run my own business, I want to know about a particular transaction, I can't actually do it these days. Or I'm waiting in 20 or 25 minutes to sometimes 35 minutes to speak to someone. And at the end of it, I may not actually have even gotten what I wanted from them. The important thing with the ones I'm about to show you is they have computational firepower. It's not just about a gimmick. It's not just about the fact that they look like a cool bot. That's not what I'm even concerned about. It's what they can actually do. Connected to your intranet, connected to your database, they would actually be able to find and mine the information that the person on the other end needs in about one tenth the time of an actual person. And these are meant to augment our work. They're not meant to replace us. And indeed, they can't replace us. The second use case in there is actually um, human perception software that tries to learn from how you work. This is a company called Automation Anywhere, no commercial connection to them. And they've got something called the IQ bot. Very, very clever stuff. It sits in the background of your screen. As you're working, it learns from how you prioritize information. So if you're putting together a report for either your team or your manager, it essentially asks you what you prioritize, learns from that and starts to automate that, then only prompting you to be involved when it needs that human judgment to clarify or check something. Very clever stuff, I've actually tried it. And the third is where this is being used in road safety software, about to be rolled out in two months by a massive automotive giant, in fact, that will essentially sit in the dashboard and through a front-facing camera, read our levels of distraction and fatigue in order to keep us safer on the road. Okay, now with the first example, some of you may think, oh, that feels like it's from the uncanny valley. It's a little bit worrying to me. Why? Because it has a face to the bot and people do get thrown by this, but you don't need to have that face. You can deactivate that and from your banking app say, I want to speak to this emotionally aware software. So long as you activate your voice or if you choose to your camera on your phone like you would with a video call, it is able to detect how the person on the other end is feeling, what they want and play that back. This is really, really clever stuff. Let's play video three, please. The more that we can make computers like humans so that we intuitively know how to interact with them, the more you can interact cooperatively with it. Hello, I'm Fatima. I'm Jamie. I'm Cash. I'm Yumi. Creating incredibly lifelike, emotionally responsive digital humans with personality and character that allow machines to talk to us literally face to face. Have you already downloaded your product? Yes, I have. I'm here today to show you how I can help customers with their banking needs. And the whole purpose is really to investigate, to explore the role that digital humans can play in improving the customer experience. It was like talking to a real person. What's my customer number, Jamie? You can find your customer number on the back of your ANZ debit or credit card. Welcome to Mercedes-Benz. I'm here to help you with your new car. You look anxious, but rest assured your health is my primary concern. That I deliver more care to more patients for less cost. So we're not trying to fool people that it is a person, but we're trying to give the biological signals which we respond to. How do we interact with those machines? So they're working on our terms. We're basically putting humans at the center of technology. When you're responsible for managing complex business processes, you are also responsible for knowledge workers who painstakingly hunt for information hidden from most automation technology, ensuring your automation solution has the right data in the right place at the right time before the technology can automate anything. This is because the vast majority of the data required to automate anything is unstructured or dark data. 
hidden data requiring continuous human intervention. It is able to learn by observing human behavior taught by humans to uncover unstructured, hidden data, liberating them to handle exceptions, make the really important decisions only humans can make. And Take us home. Got it. I was right. Tell you what, I'd love to live where they are. <laughs> so I'm seeing emotive AI used in very, very serious applications. Well, one of the companies that I would urge you to look up if you want to explore this further, just to learn more about this strand of AI, um, is actually they're called Soul Machines, and that's S-O-U-L. They developed that first example I showed you of digital people. And, you know, I'm seeing this being used by, in fact, the New Zealand government is using it. HSBC Bank and NatWest Bank are trialing it right now. I addressed an audience of financial services executive last week, and many of them said they were very impressed by what it looked like it could do for their sales and customer service. But also internally, I'm being seen to use as an actual workplace assistant where every employee could have a workplace assistant where you could simply log on and say, I can't find this information from, there was a report two, three weeks ago that had this particular information in it. I need to find those results to factor it into my next kind of a presentation, find it, go. And the system would actually do that in record time, saving us a lot of man hours and freeing us up to focus on the bigger decision making that we need. That's a big issue right now is our productivity. I'm also being like seeing this be used in adaptive learning systems to do with upskilling and helping employees in a workforce upskill and essentially learn more digital skills. So this is an area that I would urge you to keep on your radar. It's going to create a great deal of commercial value in the next few years. Now, related to what I just said, I want to briefly give you some insights on next generation business intelligence. There is a democratization taking place here since the past few years. We're now taking the most crucial aspects of data intelligence platforms that were previously only really accessible to very experienced data scientists into the hands of anyone at an organization, a salesperson, a biz dev person, an engineer. And the aim is to really transform the zettabytes and petabytes of data that we have into living, breathing, active intelligence, okay? Whether it's open data to do with your industry ecosystem or internal database, this will actually help us take better decisions and improve profitability. Now, I said at an event last year to, for Deloitte that in the not so distant future, mining this vast amount of organizational data that can't be neatly stacked or organized into a spreadsheet will demand business intelligence tools with a different kind of muscle power. And this undocumented data, uncaptured data, which you in fact saw a glimpse of that in the video I just showed you, where it showed that iceberg, right? And it showed that only 20% of it really is extractable and digitized, but a vast chunk of it is either outdated and no longer relevant or hidden in video data, sensor data, social media dialogue between your company and its customers, IMs between employees, information buried deep in email trails. This stuff is far less extractable and it's also most useful in the moment, not hours or days later. So to give you a real life example of what I mean by in the moment, I mean, there's not so much value to learn about the status of traffic half an hour after you needed it, half an hour after you passed the route for which you wanted that information, right? So in that same way, the aviation industry is starting to use these kind of instant next gen tools to make sense in real time of the 6,000 or more sensors contained in each jet engine. That's the average number of sensors, by the way. I've done a lot of work in the aviation industry. And to power predictive maintenance as well, to give a preemptive kind of cue or warning to the engineers that something's about to go wrong. So this kind of data and AI with cognitive ability can make sense of the hidden data because it adds that same human judgment that a person looking at a data set can do. 
Now, we've also got a tool like the one I'm about to show you, which analyzes sales calls live while they happen to create valuable business intelligence to do with the sentiment of a customer. Please, can we cue video four? I used to make decisions about my finances by what people said was best and not how I really felt. The emotion advisor gave me the confidence to reimagine the way I think about money and how to manage my wealth. The personalized report gave me new insights into my true feelings, as well as how my thinking style influences how I make financial decisions. The Emotion Advisor is an interactive online experience that requires you to answer nine thinking style questions. Rank your financial priorities. Watch a financial scenario video. Read your personalized report and then give your feedback. Kajito instantly delivers unprecedented insight into an agent's performance and the customer's experience for all phone conversations. Wait, so I need to pay even more? I hadn't expected that. What do those premium plans include? Uh, yeah, I know it's a bit unexpected, um, and I'm sorry about that. It's just not currently offered as a standard feature. Streaming analysis of conversational dynamics, such as mimicry, consistency, turn-taking, tone, and tenseness. Intuitive in-call notifications enable agents to speak more confidently, concisely, and compassionately. An automatically generated experience score alerts agents to the customer's sentiment, helping them adjust their speaking style for better outcomes. Kajito systematically learns the behavior of the highest performing agents and provides automated guidance to help all agents perform like the best. Okay, so that gives you some example of what I mean by these more future business intelligence tools. And in fact, the second one that you saw is a system that detects human signals in our conversation and provides live behavioral guidance to help customer service employees do better. Uh, now, to conclude this section on emotive AI and advanced business intelligence, I want to actually give you a caveat here. There is a challenge with these things. We must consider that we need ethical oversight of these kinds of developments and applications. The responsible development and usage of these tools is critical. Things like programmer's bias, coercive control in data, consumer privacy, this is all very important. And indeed, my lab believes that within the next few years, members of the workforce that are hired, for example, for AI development or even data consultants will actually need to be trained in ethics. That's one of the jobs of the future, the skills of the future is actually digital ethics. And in fact, this view is supported as well by Gartner. So I'm going to go on to our second area of technology. I'm also got a timer right here. I'm conscious of time. We're at about 26 minutes. So I want to talk about a tool that will actually enable the next generation of e-commerce and also create a sort of extended reality when we talk about the workplace of the future, this kind of hybrid fusion of on and offline. Now, you may think that this is an area that's been seen as perhaps more for the entertainment or media sectors, but that's not correct. Since 2017, it's seen uptake coming from automotive, engineering, healthcare, education, and actually heavily in financial services. So I'm talking about augmented reality. And in the way that mobile technology transformed, for example, the consumer banking landscape in the last decade, this has the potential for an equally transformative impact in the next three years. And that's why you need to know about it now. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with AR, as it's called, it's the ability to hold up your tablet or your smartphone open the camera, and then you're able to see a digital item or virtual object overlaid, superimposed onto your real world. It's not like VR where you put a headset on and you disappear from your current environment. Now you do have the headset version of AR, the Microsoft HoloLens, which is fantastic. And that is being used actually for really great engineering applications. So I will include a clip of that in the video I'm about to play. But largely, I feel the smartphone and tablet enabled version is going to really, really soar. Already, AR advertising by brands hit 1.8 billion US dollars by the end of last year. 
but I don't see many companies being aware of this or even using it. And it's actually remarkably affordable to do. So what it needs is you hold up your camera and any visual trigger, usually the company's logo, a particular keyword, things like that, will trigger that particular experience on the phone, on the device, and allow you to either, for example, overlay a manual on top of a complicated printer that isn't working, showing you exactly what is what, or it allows you to test a product from your own home. So let's play video number five to bring this to life, please. environment. That's AR put to work in industrial and enterprise and automotive applications. Cities are an example of how much information there is in the background and what AR is really good at is taking that information and making it visible. So how about a city project like a bridge or a transportation center, a freeway, or even a giant skyscraper that you're trying to build? How could AR help in those situations. AR can help in all those cases. You take a 3D model of your skyscraper and visualize it at true scale. So now you can explore it and see what it's like even before you build it. Most cities, they have construction, they have power and water and utilities of all kinds. And all of those services rely on data as the pulse of how they operate. Augmented reality is allowing them to get that out of the servers and into the hands of the workers that need to make decisions. What types of information could you overlay over an image? Say a worker goes into a job site, what could you show them? So a really common use today is in construction sites. You're taking your 3D models and combining them with real-time information, whether that's construction schedules and critical paths or actual operational data. Anything that you've got data for, whether it's the pipes running under the road, the cables, we can pop the helmet on and visualize them and see where they're running. And we can visualize our new buildings overlaid on top of that as well. It really has this potential to transform workers and elevate their skill levels. So we really think that it's going to be augmented reality everywhere. It, it won't matter what your job is, AR will touch it in some way. Now, keeping it simple, take your credit or your debit card out of your wallet or your purse, place it under the camera, and you're in action. You'll be able to see what you're spending your money on. The 3D imagery can really bring it to life, delivering a quick... For example, a customer who is considering selling their car could point at it through their smartphone's camera to find out the monthly expenses associated with the car, how much of the car loan has been repaid, the current market value of the car, and the likely change in the market value over the coming years. So for me, something like this, you know, it doesn't feel gimmicky at all. I call it augmented commerce because it will impact how we experience information. It's adding a layer to that information that you want to push out to an internal employee or an, any external stakeholder. It can be used to demystify a product, bring a showroom to someone's living room, visualize important information for on-site workers and employees, increase some sort of a brand awareness, bring material and packaging to life. And actually it's also being used to attract new talent, to recruit people in the industry. So we learn up to six times more using augmented interfa interfaces than traditional ones. This is gonna create a kind of hyper-personalized super app. So we covered two to three main advances today, human perception AI, new types of business intelligence, and augmented commerce. 
And I want to close with just a little bit of insight about the future of work and skills as we wrap this up in the last minute. So the first area I want to talk about is ethics, right? I mentioned it earlier, all our innovations are built by people. They aren't infallible. We've got to think about countering this. And so we will need more people who can understand the ethical implications of these new technologies. We will also need to think about more focus on alternative energy. As we transition towards a clean energy future, mitigating the very dangerous impacts of, for example, climate change, and as the global supply of fossil fuels begins to run out, thinking about alternative energy, I actually see a lot of jobs being created in that sector as well. You know, and how will all these roles be developed? The gig economy has been in place for many, many years now, and the job format structure is really fluctuating. McKinsey and the World Economic Forum support the same view that I've been saying for a long time. We're going to see a lot more demand for independent workers, temporary employees, freelancers, contractors. But, you know, ultimately, to close on a human note, some of the best jobs and skills of the future are actually just going to be good options because of common sense, because of advancements in digital and medicine, because of demographic changes, economic shifts. So actually, we can all try and forecast this. So my final three takeaways from today, if, if you gained any insights from this, it should be this. I think the first one would be keeping our minds quite receptive of applications that are a little more progressive, such as the ones I showed you like emotive AI or advanced data science, not writing them off as something that only the tech companies can do. Every organization, even the smaller ones with smaller budgets can actually do this. That's why I presented it, because it is accessible. The second is we've got to keep our organizational data, something that drives us, not just informs us and keeps us to be change leaders and not just watching from the sidelines. And my last tip is, Let's keep our transformation programs absolutely inclusive and bring everyone from the organization into blueprint them rather than farming it out as an IT challenge. I think we're going to open to questions now. I thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shivi, uh, for this inspiring speech. Uh, 30 minutes, it's really, really short, but uh, I think we gained some really impactful insights and uh, we will try to make most of the 15 or 10 minutes that we have left for question and answer. And we've got lots of them, uh, very interesting okay. ones. So uh, if we can't address all of them, uh, be sure that we will collect them and we will address late them later on. So I will go to the first question straight away. Mm -hmm. And it is, what are some of the leadership approaches we can take to help navigate the digital economy? You have developed something called the inventor mindset. Tell us more about that. Sure. So that's actually, um, sorry, I'm getting an echo, but I'll keep going. Is my sound okay? Can everyone hear me all right? Is that yes. all right? Yeah, it's okay. all good. There's a loud echo here, but that doesn't matter. I'll keep going. So, you know, one thing I would say is um, there's something I've uh, developed called the inventor mindset. And this is something I created about four years ago with Ernst & Young, and we launched it and it did really well. And actually, as soon as the pandemic hit, you know, they got in touch as well. And we both said, oh, my gosh, that is actually something that's p perfect as uh, one adaptive method of leading. You know, we've got to think of more adaptive ways of leading, especially while we're in a difficult time. You know, only two out of five organizations, Charlotte, believe that the leadership mindsets that are in their organizations now are actually even tangibly impacting the business. So there's a big opportunity here for adaptive styles of leading. And the approach that I call the inventor mindset is this. There's an author of a book called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. He wrote about the conflict between what we know and innovation and ingenuity. And there's a quote from him that goes, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the expert's mind, sometimes there are only a few possibilities. And actually, I think that's quite true. You know, when we started out in our careers or began our companies, I think we were much more pliable and open to questioning our own set of fixed assumptions. And we asked, where do I want to take this? What do I need to know? But actually, as you get more and more senior, I think so does that gap grow between yourself and people that actually question you and have the courage to challenge you. So I think the approach of the inventor mindset says, let's try as leaders to actually think a little like inventors as well. So what does that look like? One is 
think about actually challenging and questioning some of the thinking that you've taken into your company and your strategy that you probably haven't really questioned for many, many years. The second is getting down and dirty in the trenches, you know, get into the front line. I think to really understand what our main workforce is dealing with, you want to be there sometimes as well, seeing the situation as your main people are. But like I said earlier, that gap between senior leaders and the front line really starts to grow as you become even more of a senior leader. And I think the third one is have that ability to pivot to change your offering based on what customers want. And instead of kind of shying away from experimentation, Charlotte, I think the inventor mindset has something valuable in it, which it says, stay close to risk. You know, I know it's important to steady the ship during the current crisis. I've actually been in-house with a massive company, the third largest telco in the world for six years, as a global head of digital, when they went through a big digital transformation and there were a lot of economic situations at that time that were making it hard. And so I saw it from the inside out and I advise companies like that all the time. But I think it's very myopic in short term for companies to kind of kill the experimentation switch, turn that off at the time when actually your company probably needed it the most. It's very easy to say, let's step away from risk and experimentation when the world feels risky, when the markets seem uncertain. But actually the converse is often more true in my humble experience. This can actually open up those vital sources of revenue. And I think the last thing to say is, you know, in what inventors do very well is vision, visionary thinking, and it allows them to see the blind spots. And I think leaders could take a leaf out of that book. Thank you so much, Shivi. So experimentation uh, for sure. Uh, we will keep that in mind and keep the inventor mindset in mind. So the second question is, if pro professional decision can be affected by your personal feelings, how can we predict or influence customer behavior? That's a great question. So in fact, there's a really great quote that goes, and let me get this right. We don't just think our way to reason we feel our way to logic. Think about that. And that's actually from a very, very well-known Harvard professor. He's one of the most eminent kind of uh, professionals in the world who study consumer behavior, who study, you know, basically just neuroscience and, and human behavior and how we think. And it's incredibly true that actually even the decisions that we feel are completely objective, absolutely logical, they actually do have feeling behind it. Now, the tricky thing with this is whether you're male or female, when you hear the word feeling, you think, oh, it's a bit soft. You don't think of it as objective, but actually feelings can push you towards objective decisions because when you look at data, you aren't just looking at it with your cognitive hat on. Your brain, the neurons in your brain absorb this particular information, whether it's in a spreadsheet or a chart or a long email or a PDF document or a slide deck, whatever medium it's pushed to you in, your brain obviously processes it and takes the facts. Absolutely. I think we need to be guided by facts. That's really, really important. Um, but when you add the layer of intuition, gut feeling, decision, human consciousness, empathy, that's when actually you get a multi-layered decision. So taking a decision purely on the basis, for example, of the facts would actually mean that we probably fire lots of people every month, all right? It would probably mean that we invest in products that we shouldn't be investing in. But obviously we need to be guided by the facts. But I think the layer we add to that is what our individual experiences and the years and years of competencies we've built up that are not just to do with uh, analyzing a spreadsheet, what do those what do those have to offer? And they have to offer a lot. So when you layer that on, if you want to call that feeling or emotion, let's call it that. The problem is when we hear emotion, we think good decisions are not guided by emotion. In fact, if you're emotional, those decisions are probably going to be clouded by that emotion. That's what we're taught to think. And actually, that's, that could be true for certain business decisions. But I'm trying to say that emotion isn't just about being hysterical. It isn't about being upset or emotional or crying all the time or something ridiculous like that. It can actually just mean using your gut feeling, using your intuition. You know, some of the most visionary leaders in the world, the late Steve Jobs, um, and then one very controversial person, Elon Musk, 
people like that, Indra Nui, who's you know has always been a big name in tech. These are people who've actually often said in their talks and in their books that they are guided very much by their gut feeling and their intuition. What is that? That's essentially a feeling. So they layer that on to facts to achieve the best outcome. And this can actually uh, help us when we have the kind of business intelligence that I showed you to then predict what is a user or a consumer, whether it's B2B or B2C, what are they going to actually be looking for in their products and services? Thank you, Shivi. I'm glad we had this, uh, this question because I do think emotions and gut feeling are really important to take decision. So thank you. Um, another topic that you already mentioned before, uh, but that uh, some of um, the participants want to go uh, deeper into details. So it is about environment. So what are your thoughts on the sustainability and environmental impact of digital versus mechanical solutions? Example of the lo uh, door lock. Very precise. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And interestingly, in that example of that video, um, you know, and if you remember the strap line, it said simplicity, simplicity is key. That was actually the, the strap line they use. And I believe it's for a, a Scandinavian company that sell home security solutions like door locks. Okay. So it was a really great way to illustrate that actually sometimes when you have everything digitized, and I, I say this even as a tech futurist in many of my talks, I think we can over engineer, okay, when it comes to digital engineering. And so my worry with that is A, the fact that the usability goes down and we keep it from becoming human centric, the more and more we try and complicate this. You know, this kind of engineering needs to start at the very early, in fact, the pre-build stage when we create some of these tools and services, whether they're digital or otherwise. At that stage itself, you've got to factor in the usability, the accessibility. And then, you know, we've got UX, which is user experience. I would say there's something also called EX, which is actually the uh, very emotive experience. So how are people going to actually use this in the real world? It can be very different from what you think of as blind usability. And where, for example, energy comes into it, I actually just did a talk for Huawei on uh, the role of AI in combating climate change. And I feel very strongly that we've got to think about more than just our carbon emissions when we talk about our carbon footprint and things like that. So when we talk about a clean energy future, uh, we've got to mitigate the impacts of climate change, some of which can come from these digital technologies, others actually which can still come from the mechanical ways of working as well. You know, we had uh, we have an industrial revolution that we're in the middle of. It's called the fourth industrial revolution. It's characterized by almost this hybridity and this fusion between the analog and you know the digital and we look at this really interesting interplay between these worlds and actually you've not just got on and offline you've also got biological there are actually now believe it or not new forms of digital identity and you know feel free to look this up it's called next generation or second generation biometrics and what a lot of these people developing these technologies and they're very fascinating are saying is it's not enough for your digital identity to just be based on a username and password or what we call biological security, just your, for example, your face to unlock your phone or your fingerprint. This stuff can easily be spoofed. Some of the world's top, you know, white hat ethical hackers have shown that. So they've developed, in fact, something that is also more environmentally efficient, but is digitized, but actually in a way fuses the on and offline world really well. So it's part mechanical, part digital. And what they've said is we want to use things like your very unique biological markers, like your vein patterns, your subdermal vein patterns under your skin, or your heartbeat pattern to log you into your enterprise system, especially for organizations where the data is very sensitive. So think of defense, engineering, manufacturing, governments, and some of them are actually using the stuff to give people building access, to allow them access to systems. Okay, and this is a really good example of something that has that environmental impact built into it. But when we go back to talking about alternative energy, I think we'll see more demand for experts that are really good energy planners. These are people that will need to architect and design the most sustainable energy sources for companies, for cities, but also for countries and continents. They'll think they have to think about working across renewable energy policy with the government, energy strategies for their business, creating those roadmaps within the company for those kind of very sustainable futures and carbon management. So absolutely, that needs to be on our radar. Um, but I don't think necessarily that all digital, digitally powered technologies on those kind of infrastructural platforms 
have necessarily a higher footprint. Actually, that's a little bit of a, a myth. It's uh, quite even. Very interesting. Thank you, Shivi. Um, I know we are a little bit uh, behind schedule, uh, so we will take the last question, uh, but be sure we have the other question uh, keeping safe. So the, and the last one uh, is, which would be some of the humans' skills to develop in a world led by AI and Internet of Everything? Great question. And uh, this is something I um, uh, looked into for four months <laughs> for a piece of research called The Future of Learning for the Mayor of London's office. If you want to actually have a look in depth at the skills section in there, it's four pages. It's a really great infographic that you could uh, hopefully use and, and make some sense of. Um, and if you go to futurescape248.com, that's my lab's website. I'm not promoting myself, just letting you know where to find it. Um, it's actually on the homepage, the Future of Learning report. And you see from that infographic that I talk quite heavily about the skills we'll need, not all being to do with being conversant in AI or data or blockchain. Actually, some of the most human traits are the ones that will separate us from how we can grow a business, how we can actually increase the footprint of a company. Um, some of the best founders talk about human skills as being almost more important in some cases than simply blindly bringing in every possible type of technology into your company. So I think one of those things is actually what I mentioned earlier, human consciousness. This still isn't something that AI can do yet. There's a, a place called a Singularity University in the US. They're very controversial, but they're also very clever. And there's a guy called Ray Kurzweil, who's actually one of the most original futurists out there. And many of us have kind of, you know, he's paved the way for many of us. Uh, but his views are a little controversial. And one of the things he does say is he believes that you that AI systems will be able to show human consciousness within this decade. And I mean, I'm one of those futurists, as many others are, that firmly believe this isn't true. I don't see any AI systems now or in the future being able to actually replicate that very human trait, which is your ability to show that intuition, that empathy, for example. AI systems don't quite do empathy, even the emotionally aware ones. They can certainly simulate it, but it won't always go beyond that into every aspect of its interaction. And so I think things like empathy, understanding, team building, you know, rallying a team and bringing people together, there's no replacement for a fantastic leader who has that energy in a room or even, for example, on an online platform like Microsoft Teams or Zoom to bring people together and go, right, guys, we're going to kill this. You know, we're going to make this happen. Here's the plan. Let's get out and do it. Do you have everything you need? Uh, you know, this is going to be a great future. Let's make this happen. Here are our goals. There's no replacement for that. There is no bot in the world. There is no particular software that can motivate and inspire and create those leadership outcomes that uh, only people can do. So I think developing communication skills that are really powerful, that's probably the single most important human skill, I would say, is especially as we go more and more online during the pandemic. Unfortunately, it's not always the most talented people that will continue to thrive at that point. It's also the people that can communicate really well. So being able to articulate something, to be able to inspire energy, you know, through the screen as well. Um, I think managers and leaders that can develop that skill will thrive really well because if you can't, you know, communicate your idea, you could have the best thoughts in the world and they won't come across well. So that kind of ability to motivate, to show empathy to another person um, doesn't go out of style. This is something that will, I think, always stay in fashion, let's say. And certainly I think software cannot emulate it in the way that um, humans can.